and he's going to talk to us about the making and the history of the white man. Uh, Brother Bobby, how you doing this evening? How you doing? Okay. Everything's cool. Okay. So what, what can you tell us, you know, that maybe we, we may say that we already know and we don't know, that you can enlighten us on um, about the, the making of this white man? Well, back in 1993, I did a tape called uh, Human Artificial. And I did it in a lecture format, so I, I, in a, um, I, I uh, pretty much stuck to the main course of, of trying to explain the, the origin of the European based on the historical documents. Um, I put out this particular pamphlet a year later in 1994 called the Human Artificial, called the Human Artificials. And um, it went around the country and also it's called a, a comedic in ancient documents of the living devil. And it was a real popular piece. I mean, people zeroed it until the graphics broke up. But um, what I was trying to do, this book was a consortium of different fragments from ancient and modern people dealing with the research of this European being created um, or made, in so many words, based on genetic engineering. And so, uh, since 1994, I've gotten tons and tons of other research, so much until if I was to put it in a book, it would, it would take up about two, two of these books. That's how much information. But we don't have that much time, the, the, the uh, information we have covered before. But what I want to do is to give an update or uh, revisit this particular material uh, from 1994 and put some new research down. Um, in, the, in the school of academia and Western education, but if this, and basically a good structure for education or academia period is, in academia you, you go by two types of systems, two types of ways of looking at things. Number one, if you want to get to the truth, the first thing you have is anthropological or archaeological evidence or some type of um, scriptorial or some type of um, ancient fragments based on that would also be archaeology where we talk about papyruses and rare books and rare artifacts that would actually literally tell the story of what are you trying to look for and this would actually be the basis of the truth. Now you can have a theory, and a theory could be the basis on what you might say, give a synopsis of what you are trying to postulate when it comes to the origin of something, uh, trying to get close to the meaning. And that theory can be viable, it can be substantial to a certain degree until archaeological and anthropological evidence comes into to play. So, now dealing with the, the history of the European, we have several theories. Well, a white boy just decided he just don't want to deal with it at all. You know what I mean? He, he, he analyzes things down to the teeth. But somehow when it comes to the origin of his self, when we ask this question, well, if the black man was the original person, which, which um, me tells you, uh, Mendel, me and different other people and all types of archaeological finds, late 1800s, early 1900s, late 20th century, all types of archaeological finds including the, what's that, Newsweek magazine, 1970, 1987, or 88, I think it was 1980, 1988 might have been, and where they actually showed the two black people in the garden, eat garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. A Jerry Curl version, but still yet. <laughs> still yet. This is the basic fact that most humans now understand that civilization started in Africa. But all of a sudden, the European, all of a sudden, he has a way to just basically become ignorant. Whereas when we ask this question, well, if the origin came from Africa, where the hell did you come from? Because you being the doggone opposite of that origin. 
You see what I'm saying? In color, prototype, you know what I'm saying? Phenotype, <laughs> uh, strength, any kind of thing across the board. Well, where did you come from? And all of a sudden, they never entertained the question. Few black scholars tried to entertain the question, but they went based on a theory. Check into Diop. Um, Dr. Charles Finch. They went on a theory of climate adaptability. But it's only a theory. And it stands as a theory until you find anthropological and archaeological evidence. Well, they've always had it, but what I did was is I combinated all of this particular stuff seven or eight years ago, and we got to the bottom of this. And so, but people still don't want to deal with it. People still want to deal with it. Some people say, well, what difference does it make? Well, it makes all the difference in the world if you have a hybrid species running civilization. Then, if you have problems in the world as indigenous people, you can pretty much say that in your lifetime, you should never feel comfortable with a hybrid species that has shown you forms of inhumanity. So are you saying this, this European, this Caucasian, is a hybrid of sorts? A hybrid. I don't want to say mutation because mutation or mutant is a natural phenomenon in nature. It might be a one millionth of a chance, but it's still natural. You see what I'm saying? Um, it, it, might be, it might be a freak where you have a mutation after so many thousands and thousands of, uh, of, of cycles, you have a mutation in anything. But nevertheless, nature does mutate. You see what I'm saying? The earth does have forms of mutations. You see? Um, they go on all the time. So, we don't want to call them a mutant. We want to call them a hybrid. A hybrid is a deliberate, genetic, um, concoction or deliberate um, experiment, you see, or a hybrid can be a mistake, but not a form of nature, because most mutations in nature, although they are very rare, they don't occur to create a whole race of mutations. You know, over the years in the conscious community, we've always referred to them as, as mutants. Mm -hmm. You're shedding the light on new science, right. the hybrid information. Hybrid, which we're talking about mock. A mock is a copy of the original. It's a knockoff of the original. This is a knockoff Brightman of the original. <laughs> you know, this is a $6,000 watch. And it's original state, $39 <laughs> in Canal Street, Manhattan, New York. <laughs> That's a knockoff watch. That's the, there's a difference, you see. There's a hybrid state, and we need to make this very clear. What we're talking about here is a immigrant human. Hmm. An immigrant human, something that migrates in and as the Holy Kabbalah, A.E. Waits Holy Kabbalah says, it is a, uh, how does he put it, um, an intruder. Something that is not there in the beginning that is intruding and perpetrating a fraud as a human. The fact of the matter that it was created outside of the general civilization of humanity, of ancient civilization of humanity, when it did show up, people took it as a, another strain of a race. You see what I'm saying? Uh, another strain of humanity, or what you would call a different aspect of humanity. All because its, its incubation period was secret. You see, was secret. And uh, so when people saw it thousands of years later, they automatically just thought it was a form of humanity. And as a result, this has been the mistake of indigenous people around the world because number one, our nature is that to accept. We accept everything. Accept everything. We 
accept humanity, then there is a difference. Give you a, an example of what we're talking about here. Before we, because we'll get into the psychological aspect, but this is a, a, a good analysis right now. In the workplace, two kind of doggone creeds, two kind of natures. In the workplace, you walk past a black person you know, you say, hey, how you doing? You feel that person. You walk past that person two hours later, you might greet them again. You walk past them another two hours later, you might greet them. You might greet them all day. But that's us. We go by, we go by what we feel. And we go by um, how we feel about people. The difference. We, we go by how we feel about humanity. Whereas well, a white boy come, he might greet you in the morning. You see him two hours later and you greet him again, he might think you're crazy. You understand what I'm saying? Now the difference here is this species goes by how you make them feel. So you know you know the old saying, well, you know, I really like you, but you're not like the rest of your people. That is because they don't feel nothing for the rest of your people. They're only responding because you, based on the way that you made them feel. You might have made them feel a certain way. It's like that, the movie Bingo Long and all, Traveling All Stars, which is a basic fundamental thing in all uh, uh, forms of entertainment in America. You know, they took to the road, they broke off from the Negro League. You know the movie, they took to the road, they said they're going to play white teams. They were beating the hell out of the white teams, and white teams was getting all mad, and they had to go in and start doing all kinds of buck dancing, and clowning to kick their behinds. Because the European goes by the way you make him feel, not how he feels about you. There's a difference. Mm. You see what I'm saying? It's always, you can produce a certain way to make him feel. He will accept you based on the way you made him feel. But not necessarily accepting you just by being a human. So they can love a Michael Jordan because Michael Jordan has over and above made them feel a certain way based on his talent. But they don't necessarily like the race that Michael Jordan comes from. There is a difference. There, 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 there's a difference. So we're just talking about two types of natures. Whereas we, the indigenous person around the world, he accepts you just because you're human. And that is the humane thing to do. So these crews that came in, this particular European that came in, we automatically accepted him because something in the way, something, something, something broke down where we didn't have full access on its creation because it was created by a renegade priesthood in secret. And that's what we need to get into tonight also too and go into this particular uh, science. Um, so what we want to do is, is um, we want to go into several uh, aspects of evidence to deal with this. Now, let's get with the evidence right offhand so we'll know, so we can document some of this stuff. Um, do you know that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is an adaptation of the creation story of the white man. Here's a book called Tobias Curtin, The Gnostics. The Gnostics is a ancient, um, a ancient Camite group, ancient Camite group of Egyptians during the Alexandrian age and during the latter day period of Kemet at the temple of Isis at Philae, you had Egyptian priests that translated ancient hieroglyphic documents from Metaneta into Coptic religion. This is a book called um, The Gnostics. The Gnostics is a black ancient group which in actuality, this is the group that Paul, Josephus, and other writers of the, especially, uh, especially writers of the New Testament copied the Gnostics work on the Gnostic Christ that comes out of Kemet copied their works and then when the Gnostics rebelled and said hey wait a minute the Jesus that you're talking about here is not the Jesus that we worship then the Roman government killed off the Gnostics 
and took their religion. You see the whole the story. It's always a classic thing with somebody, you got two people doing something. One, one person takes the other person's stuff and then kill the person off. Well, that's exactly what happened. Christianity is a stolen legacy that was killed off by an ancient group of people that was killed off called the Gnostics. The old, and basically, this is the origin of the New Testament. The key here is, the key here with the Gnostics is, they had a Christ long before the birth of so-called Jesus Christ of 2,000 years ago, which, um, which basically was mythological aspect historicalized by, that's a political move done by the Roman government. The Gnostics basically were a later day Camite group that basically refashioned the same Horace myth. The difference between the Gnostics and the the later day Christians or what you would call, which is the Roman invention, is the Gnostics said that as well as the Gnostics, the Hebrews, the, the Arabs, the Sumerians, as well, uh, uh, just any ancient group. Any ancient group, because um, there's a discrepancy with all this Sumerian stuff and Babylonian stuff, because in actuality, Walter Williams is right on this one. They talk about all these ancient cultures, but we can't go nowhere and find them. They say that Babylonia was his greatest ancient kingdom, yet we can't find up with some little clay tablets. <laughs> we talk you know, we talk about a whole civilization we can't find. So obviously the white man is making up some stuff. But in so many words, Jesus was, was nothing but dog on states of the same Egyptian government. So all of it was Kemet. All of it was killed. The difference is, is the ancient world said that the Messiah is to come in the last days. The Romans say, no, we're going to make it come 2,000 years ago. And that is the great mystery that's going on. Sublime mythology makes grotesque history. So we're looking at a person of 2,000 years ago. You understand what I'm saying? That the attributes of the divine Christ is supposed to come back in the last days, in the latter days, which is the God Horus, Mithra, Perseus, Jason, Hercules, um, Dionysus, Sheba, uh, Krishna, you understand what I'm saying? Krishna, Bacchus, Ha'ur, Raherukahuti, um, Quetzalcoatl, all this particular one was all the ones talk, all the cultures talk about. They talk about the end time Mashiach or Messiah. The Romans made it a historical person of 2,000 years ago, and that is the difference. Now, Dealing with this, the Gnostics, in this particular book, the Gnostics, Cliff DeVias actually quotes Mary Shelley. And Mary Shelley, in the book, Man the Monster, chapter 2 of Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, it was written when, um, when Blake was 59. Now, Blake is a, is a philosopher also. Uh, William Blake is a philosopher also. When Blake was 59... Uh, and, and, and say, we were in of the beginnings of Victor Frankenstein's quest to obtain powers of God. Victor confessed that during the trip to uh, Fanon, a town near the French Alps situated in the shores of Lake um, um, Lennon, and he goes into this thing where as she's quoting what Frank, Victor Frankenstein is inspired or what he is actually trying to attempt and in her novel appears the word of the human Asclepius. And Asclepius Imhotep. is Imhotep. Is the Greek form of Imhotep. And it's the Greek, and this is what this is the same God that all physicians swear to with the Hippocratic oath. Imhotep, which is also giving a remnant of an ancient Egyptian school, a mystery system, that in actuality, Victor Frankenstein, although a fictional character, is basically a, a, a retelling of the same old story of a person that creates his own human. So we're talking about Mary Shelley here. Understanding in these certain occult societies that was springing up all around Europe at the time. And these occult societies that was custodians of different works like your Rosicrucians, who literally had this particular information of the creation of the European left behind by the Moors in Europe at the University of Salamanca and 16 other universities in Europe. They had all of these particular texts. 
We'll go into some of these texts in a few minutes. Go into some of these texts in a few minutes. But Mary Shelley mentions Asclepius or M Hotel, which is alluding to an ancient arcane school of knowledge. This is very key. This, this, this is very key. This is in the book Cliff Tobias book page 133 of his book called The Gnostics where he mentions that and it's in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein book. We're just tying this thing in from the fictional as well as the actual, the actual evidence based on fact. Now, going back, isn't it amazing that outside of the fiction, or outside, excuse me, of the uh, theory, that the only hard-nosed evidence that we have is archaeological and anthropological. Which in actuality, we don't have to theorize on this. We actually have the ancient people out of their own mouths giving this particular information. And we're going to go through some of this particular stuff. Uh, go through some of this particular stuff. Now, the first thing we need to do, because we're talking about immigrant humans, a hybrid species. The first thing we need to do is I'll give a rendition of this, on what actually went down. Now, in this book, Hermetica, by Walter Scott, Interesting that this book is not hard to find, but this book is being printed. It's just that if you go to the Rosicrucian Library out in California, they still sell this book. But all of a sudden, I noticed when I started really pumping this book, it became harder and harder to find. If you've noticed, if you've noticed a lot of times, um, certain books that I talked about, just mysteriously, it became harder and harder to find, and I'm not necessarily saying that in actuality that I'm ego tripping. Literally, people around the country, books that was plentiful until I started, until I started talking about them over and over again, this became harder and harder to find. But nevertheless, we have several texts, but this one, this one I think is 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 the one that is quintessential to what we're talking about here. Because in this particular book, on one of the pages, one of the pages, and Lord knows a book this thick with about mm, 530, 545 pages. To close the book and lose the damn page means you got to labor. Because the book doesn't have an index because it's taken from ancient fragments. And somehow the book got closed on the doggone page, but I will quote it to you because all I need to do is just show you the book. Walter Scott's Hermetica, where the Egyptians or the Canaanites say that their biggest problem was to create another man. That's what the Egyptian says, documented in this particular book. That our biggest problem was to create another man. Right off the, the, off the Hermetic text, and now to explain something about the Hermetic text, the Hermetic text comes from, is, is the Greek word for Tahuti. The wisdom of Tahuti is the oldest science and some of the oldest science in the world, science, in sciences in the world that go all the way back, reach all the way back to Atlantis. If, I know that that's the last suicide for most people of the collegiate world, but let's just understand that the Greek sage, that, that, that the Greek solid said that it was an Egyptian sage that talked about Atlantis. Now, Dr. Ben said that he did admit that this Greek sage, because I got the same text, talked about this Greek, excuse me, this Greek, uh, this, this Greek philosopher talked about how an Egyptian sage or a high priest told him about Atlantis. He did admit that. He did admit that. But he just said we just don't have enough evidence on it. But there's tons of evidence on this particular um, information. It's just that it's found in ancient mythology. And we got to understand that mythology, which we've been duped on this one, mythology is truer than history because mythology is mutu, divine sayings, a true sayings. Mythology is the way the ancients recorded their history. 
You see, their history. Um, so there's tons of information on this uh, this land before the flood and the land after the flood, antediluvian land after the flood and before the flood. Um, there's tons of information on this uh, on this particular uh, um, aspect. You got, um, I mean, all of your Vedic texts and literally your Hermetic texts. So, the Hermetic text also says, I'll quote something out of here, and so there, and so to, so to the kinds of races of men, that of birds and all the beings of the universe contain and generate individuals of like form of, of to their kind. And then yet there are other living kinds of living beings, which are the void of soul. Indeed, yet not without sensation. So that they are gladdened by all that does them good and suffer the pain of all that impairs harm to them. Now this is the point I want to get to here. The kinds consist of all things are implanted in the soil and spring forth life which from fix. I'm going to get right to the point right here. I'm going to get right to the point. Let's see if it's on this page. Because this is most um, most quintessential to what I'm trying to say. Um, I'm trying to let's see if I if it's if it's on another page. I want to find right the right page on this thing. Because it says that there are another kind of living beings which are devoid of soul. So they say that these humans, these race of men, there are races of men that the Hermetic scripture says that are devoid of of soul, is it all? That are devoid of soul. And they say that they are men with souls and men devoid of soul. Now what we're talking about here is scholarship of the highest quality. Because if the European boasts on uh, his Western education, it is the Hermeticus Corpus, which is the basis of Western thought. The Corpus Hermeticus, which is the wisdom of Tehuti, which is brought up by the Moors, which is also brought up later by later Europeans that got it from Latin and from Greek. And this stuff was wrestled out of the library of Alexandria. You see, so we're talking about some of the oldest texts in the world. But in this particular book, Hermetica, it says that one of our greatest problems is, this is what the Egyptians are saying, that we created another man. Walter Scott's translation of a Hermetica. Um, what year is this book? Because um, some of us like the older texts. Um... The older texts. Uh, Hermetica early works, 1800s. Um, I think it was later than that. I think it was done in the 1930s. Walter Scott's work. Um, Walter Scott's work. But this is crucial, crucial information. Now, since the Egyptians say in their own words that they created another man, where do we get this from? And what happened? Well, what happened was, well, first of all, I want to read this particular part here. Um, coming out of ancient Kemet, documented Gerald Massey, we talked about this on the first human artificial, we'll put this in again as Exhibit A, Exhibit B, or whatever. Mm -hmm. The Egyptians identified themselves on the mountain of Rut. Now this is coming from the this is coming from the uh, the temple of Seti One at Biblium El Maluk. What? I need to go over. Hmm? No. Oh, blue cup. Oh. 
Oh, okay. No hurry. Oh, okay. No hurry. We, we, we don't have to be formal and stuff. People have <laughs> seen a lot of our videos, you know. Keep going, bro. We don't have to be formal at all of our videos and stuff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this ain't Channel 12. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, the, um, the Temple of Biblium Elmanuk at the Temple of Ramesses the fifth, but it's Ramesses the first, 71, but also in Biblium Elmanuk, Ram Ramesses the fifth, you have this stuff. Now this is very interesting here because we know that the first Holy Land that ever, it was, it, the first Holy Land before there was ever any Israel was a Holy Land in ancient Kemet called Abydos. And in Abydos, there's a temple called the Temple of Seti One built by Ramesses the second for his father that had just died, Ramesses the first Seti One. Ramesses the second built this temple at Abydos at the first Holy Land when he was about 22 or something like that. It is one of the most beautiful preserved temples in it in Kemet, whereas the actual, the bas reliefs in the actual temple, other than other one, other than the engravings in the other temples, was raised. So in actuality, you could feel it, and it was actually raised off of the wall. And it's, and it's done in some of the most beautiful paintings, paint, and it's one of the most beautiful temples preserved on the inside. And it's very interesting about this temple. They never showed this temple in Kemet, in Egypt. You never see this temple. It's one of the temples that they never show. And they always show all the temple of Edfu, the temple of uh, Luxor, the temple of Karnak, the temple of Dendera, the temple of Isis, the temple of Esna. You see what I'm saying? They always show these temples um, in most books. They don't usually show a lot of temples um, um, in, on TV. Not unless they're trying to exploit something. Because to me, the temples are some of the greatest architecture in the world. You saw I build on a pyramid. Try building an Egyptian temple. But one temple that they never ever show, and that is the temple of Seti One at Abydos. I'm collecting Camite or Egyptian artifacts and Egyptian pictures, pictures in from the late eighties and the, the late eighties and the early nineties. And other than Dr. Ben's book, books. Um, Abyssal, um, Ab Abyssal to Giza, I don't find a lot of pictures of this temple. Now I find literally, other than Um Seti's book, which is a white woman who, who, who spent her whole life at the Temple of Seti One and in that area. Um, and you can also get a documentary on her at National Geographic did a thing called Egypt the Eternal Quest. They did it in 1982. You still show it on PBS every now and then. But outside of that little thing with Um Seti, and outside of um, Dr. Ben's book, who just so happened to be a black man, you don't get no pictures of Seti One. Now, I got two pictures of Seti One, and it's very interesting. I get a, a, a picture and a painting, a painting. A real nice watercolor done in the, like the late 1800s when they first started traveling into Kemet. Late 1800s to mid 1800s. I get this beautiful preserved temple and they quote that it's one of the most preserved temples in Kemet, Egypt. I don't get any more pictures of this mysterious picture that I have in my library at home again. The next time I get a picture, the next time I get a picture is 1989 and the temple is completely torn apart and reassembled and it looks nothing like the original temple in the 19th century painting. Even said it one, um said By the time she said she gets there in the 1920s or the 1930s, this white woman, she said the temple was completely dis demolished. And she spends her whole life with him literally trying to put this temple back together. By 1982, this temple is put back together, but it looks entirely different from the temple that I got in the 19th century drawing. 
And I get one picture, a color picture in 1989. It's an entirely different temple. And even the temple that Dr. Men visits in the late 80s and in the, in the early 90s is an entire, entire different temple than the one from the late 1800s. Or mid to late 1800s. That meant that there was something in that temple that they saw. And they saw it earlier because Champollion, Champollion, who is supposed to be the author of, uh, who's supposed to be the person that actually uh, deciphered hieroglyphics, which is a lie. Come to find it, it was a black man, here he goes again, it was a black man at the University of Chicago that just looked at the hieroglyphics and just knew it based on genetic observation, a genetic memory bank. And he was the one that translated the majority of that. As usual, there's another black man whose story never gets out. And Champollion gets the credit. But nevertheless, Champollion goes to Kemet right after hieroglyphics has been translated. He goes to Egypt, sets sail to Egypt, and he writes 16 letters back to Champollion the Elder, which is his oldest brother. And when he gets to the temple of Seti I, he is very upset in his letters about what he found about the origin of the race, the white race. And in this, they talk about this temple of Seti I, they talk about there's four races of men. These are the four races of men. The four races of men. This one down here is suggesting the Tamahu from ancient Egypt. The Tamahu, which is the white man. Now, this picture of the four races of men is found in a book, Ignatius Donnelly's book. One of the, one of the few people that actually printed the, the picture. Ignatius Donnelly's book, Atlantis, the Antilubian World. Antilubian World. This picture here I, I, I put under the bottom is found in Albert Churchward's book, Signs and Symbols of Primordial Man. But nevertheless, this is the actual, the actual pictures that is explained by Gerald Massey, who is indicating what Champollion saw when he wrote back to his oldest brother, uh, Champollion the Elder. And it says, the Egyptians identified themselves on the monuments as the root, R-O-U-T. A pictorial representation is found at the tomb of Seti I, and there are four races of, 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 of people arranged in the groups of four men each, here is the picture of the four men. Red, yellow, black, and white. Well, we'll go into that. Of four men each. These are the Nashi, N-A, Nashi, Anasi, N-A-H-S-I, Negroes, the Himu, men of a light brown hue, uh, with blue eyes and hair in a bag, and the Tamahu, which are the fair Europeans and the root who are the Egyptians are the root who are the Egyptians so your Nazi, your Negroes and your root are the the Egyptians this is the uh, the four races of men the Himu, the Tamahu, the Nazi and the Ruti so we know that the, the Nazi and the root are the Ruti are the ancient types East African, West African these are the typical groups are not meant merely for conquered races as may be gathered from significance of their names. The Tamahu are the white, light complected people. In the Egyptian word, Tamil means people and created, who are the created white, light, and ivy. So, ta so Tamil means people and created. Who means, excuse me, White light and ivory. The tower who means the created white people. Well, who created them? The knob is black ink. The net is black bird. The shoe is a person of birth, which means the original birth of the original people. The nashim is it was one black born, or the Egyptian phrase, the black egg from the egg shoe. You see, from the egg shoe. So in so many words, the Ruti and the Nashi, or the Nasi, are the original races. Goes on to say that the Ruti and the Nasi created the Himu and the Tamahu. So the Himu and the Tamahu. So the Himu would be.
be a brother look like me. You see, light complected, light brown complected. Shank Anthony Diop in his book, African Origins of Civilization, Myth and Reality, gives the entire story of the town of who in his book. He omits the section of the Tamahu found in the temple of Seti One, which in Gerald Massey's Book of the Beginnings, Volume 1, page 27, he re he puts the page back, or in actuality, the page can't be found, because Gerald Massey is before Diop. The page can't be found. But he omits this particular part of the Tamahu in um in his particular book, uh, ancient art, uh, uh, African origins of, the, uh, of of civilization, myth, and reality. But you get the whole story of the Tamahu and Champollion and what he found in his disappointment and all of that. But in Gerald Mass's book, uh, Book of the Beginnings, Volume Book of the Beginnings, A Book of the Beginnings, Volume One, Volume Twenty Seven, you actually get that particular page. You 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 get that particular page now. Going back, we have a link of the Egyptians apparently creating this race of people. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said it in the Theology of Time that the Egyptians created the white man. Well, in Hermetica, they say that our biggest problem is we created another race of people. In the Hermetic text, Camite text. Now, Going back, let's try to trace this story on when did it happen. First of all, we understand that there was no such thing as Egypt. That's the Greek name. The name was Cam, just like another ancient name of uh, Ethiopia was Cush, Punt. These particular names, Cam, Cush, Punt, these names meant they were describing certain areas and certain people. So the word Cam, the word Kush, all that means black. The key here is that the origin of Kemet goes back further than the 3,000 years. Well, the high priest Manetho gives us roughly about 8,000 to 10,000 years. But if we want to go back, we know that the Sphinx is carbon dated to 90,000 years. We know that the pyramids would, is just as old as just that they had white limestone casings on them, which the Arabs, when they invaded, they used to build Cairo from the limestone casings of the, great, the three great pyramids. The point is that these things are very old and way older than 3,000 years ago. You see what I'm saying? They're older than Khufu. Now in your book, and then one good one thing I can say about the scholarship of Zachariah Sitchin is we know that he has his angle because he's trying to write something for the European Jews, but still yet, they have the money, they have the research, they have the research to finance things. He can get several archaeological things that most people can't get. And yes, in his book, Stairway to Heaven, he goes into the science in the back of the book on forging the pyramids, which we know that the pharaohs in Kemet would come about and they would forge earlier temples, edifice, and, and buildings. You would, like Ramesses, take for instance, forged his name on the temple of Luxor and covered up stuff from Tutankhamun. You see. So we know that they were always, when they would do repairs on something, a lot of times, they would either forge their name or they, they would get attributed to building the work. They said that Khufu did repairs on the pyramids. You see what I'm saying? Repairs on the pyramids. Um, these things are way older than what, we, uh, than, than what we can suspect. So, given the age of the Egyptians, now Blavatsky's book said that the Egyptian priests would never tell the origin of what they were. They were just toying with the Greeks. In so many words, we the, 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 the knowledge that we get on um, 
the whole 3,000 year of ancient Kemet from Manetho's book Sartus. It's just that Manetho was toying with, and they said, well, the, the Greeks are so interested in chronology. Just give them a synopsis. So the little 3,000 years, the little 10,000 years, is some stuff that he gave them, which has all kind of discrepancies in right now. Um, where they have all kind of conferences and saying this stuff, a lot of this stuff don't hold up. So they gave them the 500 pharaohs of the of of uh, the the three the the, the the 300 pharaohs of the pre of the dynastic and the 500 pharaohs of the pre dynastic, just to shut the damn Greeks up. But they said that even Blavatsky's book said that they would never tell the origin. You don't never tell a person your origin because a person can dictate how to control you based on how old you are. They would know exactly what to deal with. And the Egyptians and the Camites, that was very secret, and they would never give the origin of that. And only one, they didn't deal with time the way we dealt with time. You see what I'm saying? Now, e even in the book, in Jeremiah's book, Natural Genesis, also quoted with Blavatsky's book, Secrets of Doctrine, they say that the Egyptians plotted the stars for 40,000 years and didn't tell no damn body. Plotted the damn celestial universe for 40,000 years. They said that they have a 25 year cycle. The Egyptians talk about a 25 year cycle of the world's great year. 25, excuse me, 25,000 year cycle of the world's great year. Said the damn Egyptians went through eight of them. You see what I'm saying? So we're talking about, just like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, there ain't no birth records, there is no time. This stuff goes on and for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Now the document that they found in the British Museum, very old, it was an Arabic document. They couldn't even find the regular Arab, the, the, the regular Arab speaking people. They couldn't even find it. They had to go and get an old ancient Arab family with the ancient dialect to translate these particular documents that was left behind by the Moors. And when they translate, they had to go get a black family in Arabia. Some of the, one of those black families that is left behind. You know, you go to the late Arabia and it's 85 percent black. They had a conference at the Arabian Expedition. They had a conference, they had an expedition, uh, an exhibit of, of, of ancient Arabia, or uh, Arabia in 1989 that I went to in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was like, wait a minute, is this Arabia? Because I thought it was Africa. It was blue black people all over Arabia. So they had to go and get one of those particular people with a dialect to translate this particular fragment that was left behind in the British Museum. And when they translated, they found out that the chronology went two billion years. And we're not talking about two billion men or some eight man. We're talking about two billion years of advanced high beings. Exactly what the dog on mythology talks about. So we're like, man, we don't even have anything that can even calculate that. The only thing we even had to come close to that was the Armalized Muhammad saying that the black man was 66 trillion years old, which is a symbolic number we don't know. And it's no different than what the doggone mythology talks about as millions of years. Even in this book, the Nag Hammadi Library, dug up in 1945, Translated by James Robinson in this particular book, where well, you have a mythology that will span in two pages 10 million years. In two pages of the actual mythology, of the actual text. This stuff is very old. This stuff is very old. Remember now, the white boy has got to push the timeline up to 6,000 years because that is the time that he comes into play. So this is a form of psychological mind control. If you give the world only 6,000 years, he can justify or he can tell you that he's always been here. That's what black people say now. Well, we got to live with him. Not if they only been here a few days ago. Now, going back, the Egyptian priest that we talk about in Kemet, we're talking about literally thousands of years ago. Now, this puts this thing back to Atlantis, these play on words. Whether you call it Egyptian, Cam, Kush, Atlantis, Lemuria, all that stuff. Alcamore, there's several names for the planet Earth. 
Or there's several names for the planet Earth. You see what I'm saying? Time Mary, we talk, we got this big debate going on. For a play on words, we just say a long ass time ago. In this case, we'll pick Atlantis. Because we got tons of information on this in the Vedic text, um, Gnostic texts, um, several texts, um, Hesed's theogony, um, the Enuma Elish coming out of so called Babylonia. We got tons of this stuff. The Gilgamesh ethics, there's tons of this stuff that is in mythology. Now, going into this particular stuff, what happened? What happened? Let me give you two synopsis on this thing. The Rosicrucians, the Rosicrucians, which are, is a European Masonic group, um, is some of the custodians of the ancient documents of the making of the white man brought into Europe by the Moors when the Moors ruled for 700 years and set up 16 universities. The Rosicrucians become the custodians of all these ancient texts. And several other occult groups become custodians of several ancient texts. So what we call a quote-unquote Yakub story, the Rosicrucians had one. As a matter of fact, one of the Rosicrucians told me back in 1992 um, that the white man is an experiment gone bad. He said, but the UFOs is coming to take care of this mess. That, that was his rendition of it. Anyway, we talk about a divine power. This is what the Rosicrucians said. The Rosicrucians also said that the only place where you can find the, 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 the granite from the capstone of the Great Pyramid is only in one place, Stone Mountain, Georgia. So whether you choose to believe it or not, these people hold on to all kinds of secrets. And to this day, we talk about we live in an integrated society. Try getting up in them white lodges. See what I'm saying? That's why we shouldn't let white people up in our events. Because they have meetings on us every day discussing our faith. And you are not invited. You can't get up in a doggone legitimate white lodge. All this great land of immigration and freedom, go and get in a white lodge. Because the white lodge is the only doggone educational system in America. And they are not going to let you be educated. Outside of the new research of this black stuff that I'm putting together and other scholars, the only educational system in America where you get a complete education of the universe, the world, and how the world works, the origin of man and the whole God and stuff, is the doggone white lodges. And they ain't gonna enter, they might integrate some a few little tuxedo wearing niggas on the on the on the on the ground level. But we're talking about the people that run this world, don't you let nobody fool yourself. You can't get up in there and you are not invited to the table. That's why we shouldn't invite white people. You see what I'm saying? In our forums. Because you can't go to the meetings that, 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 that they make decisions on your everyday life. So are you saying that the black Masonic Lodges are just a, a club or something? The black Masonic Lodges is no different than the AKAs, the Deltas. You know what I'm saying? A uh, Pi Bacon Club, Zeta Phi Beta, Sigma Gamma Rho. You know what I'm saying? All that is is a social club, drinking liquor and driving cab. You know, it has nothing to do with real ancient Egyptian mystery system whatsoever. As a matter of fact, most black Masons didn't even know what the fuck Kemet was. You know what I'm saying? They're thinking that 33 years of the 33 years of Jesus Christ. Well, wait a minute. Hell, Jesus Christ wasn't even on the planet when this shit was put down. You know what I'm saying? And the singing Negro spirituals and stuff like that. That has nothing to do with real ancient knowledge. Ancient knowledge is an educational system, nothing short of the educational system that Negroes go to and call themselves edumacated. That is an inferior education compared to the original mystery system. This is a lifelong study. You understand what I'm saying? So, no, the Black Lodge is, is nothing but a joke. It's a pathetic joke. Uh, the, I will say the goals and the objective of the Black Lodge in its inception was honorable with, 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 with Prince Hall. What I think he was trying to put forth, but we talking about the Black Hall, that we, the, the Black Lodge we've had it for most of the 20th century, ain't nothing but a doggone uh, stymie and 
our gang little rascals club and shit, you know, with a little dog with a circle around his eye and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Or the honeycomb hideout club and stuff. You know what I'm saying? The secret handshake and all this kind of thing here. Or the peanuts gang. You know, some Charlie Brown shit. You know, and the son Lucy and the dog that sleep on top of the dog on dog house and shit like that. It has nothing to do with real, real ancient mystery system at all. Uh, a 33rd degree mason or whatever and stuff like that is almost a, a person in kindergarten, even compared to compared to a brother like me, you know, I have to, just to sit down and do this particular lecture on, I got to come with basic tools. You see what I'm saying? To, 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 we're talking about real comprehensive scholarship here. Now, going into this particular science, um, the Rosicrucians tell us of two stories. One story is found in Rudolf Steiner, Head Rosicrucian, Rudolf Steiner's book, Atlantis and Memoria, which is hard to get. You can find all of Rudolf Steiner's books, but you can't find this particular book. One of his other books, good books, is Cosmic Memory and Universe, Earth, and Man. Excellent books. And in that particular one, Atlantis and Memoria, they talk about a god of Manu, or this particular scientist named Manu, that took a germ from man and made another race of men. It also goes and talk about the moon separating from the earth. Same stuff that the message to the black man talked about, that people scorn and say it's hosh, posh, and ludicrous. Rudolf Steiner's Rhoda Smoser Crusoe talks about the same thing of the making of the white man. Rudolf Steiner's, um, Rudolf Steiner's contemporary at that time is H.G. Wells, who, wrote, writes, who writes the fictional adaptation, The Island of Dr. Moreau. You just need to get that movie to find out the origins of the white man as well as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to give you a synopsis on what's going on. But his is closer to the truth because in this particular science, now we have those particular documents and we have other stuff, but in this particular information, because we do have the hermetic text where the Egyptians say our problems and we made another race of people. So we got about involved with scholarship here. We can go on and on and on and we will. But in this, let's go into a, a synopsis. We're talking about thousands of years ago, so the best thing I can do to paint this picture is to give you a synopsis that is done by the ancient art of channeling. In this case, my um, ex-mate Ginger McFarlane channeled closer to the truth on what actually happened, which later on I verified in these particular scriptures also, too, in these particular books. And in so many words, Let's just, give, let's just give a name to this thing. Let's give a name to this particular character. We'll just say Yakub. We do have him in Donald B. Redford's book, Egypt, Canaan, and Israel as a real person. Um, a so-called quote-unquote Hyksos god. Now we know that the Hyksos is nothing but the pre-dynastic Egyptians. So let's say a pre-dynastic Egyptian god or two pre-dynastic pre um, Egyptian person that they end up worshipping. We also have it in um, um, uh, some other works, some fictional works of a woman by the name of Lynn, Lynn Carter's book on the mystical, the mystical uh, whereabouts or the mystical experiences of Ya'akub, Ya'akub, um, which is also uh, 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 defined as Jacob in some in the Hebrew text, but let's just let's just take that word for right now, just for the sake of argument. We'll, we'll just whether you believe that or not, we'll talk about a, a fictional character. Well, I'll add a little more light to it so it'll, it'll bring it into phase, bring bring this thing into focus. Excuse me. In ancient Atlantis, or the ancient schools of ancient Kemet, mainly in the Hermetic schools, are the wisdom of Tahuti are the schools of Tehuti, which later was identified as the city of On in Heliopolis, Kemet, and which also is connected with Imhotep, the first physician or doctor and the father of medicine, which is also connected with King Zosa, who 
um, um, who commissioned Imhotep to build the first pyramid of Kemet, the step pyramid in Kemet. So we got a connection and a, and a tradition going on of the Temple of the Wisdom of Tahuti. To give some more information on the Wisdom of Tahuti and this particular school, uh, get um, Graham Hancock's book, The Sign and the Seal. Because even your whole science of the Ark of the Covenant and how to make this particular chest of Osiris, come, Osiris comes out of Graham Hancock's book. But anyway, this school of Tahuti, uh, the Wisdom of Tahuti, uh, which is a picture here of the god Tahuti, another book that just recently came out called The Way of Hermes. The Way of Hermes. Which Hermes is the Greek word for Tahuti. Arthos is another word, but Tahuti is the Egyptian word. And it says new translations of the Corpus Hermeticum and the, the definitions of Hermes Price Magistus to Ap Asclepius. Here's that word again, here's, which is M. Hotel. Uh, this book here is by Clement Solomon, Doreen Van Oyen, William D. Wharton, and Jean Perry May. Uh, the book called uh, put out by Inner, Tra Inner Traditions, uh, Rochester, Ver Vermont, The Way of Hermes, which is, to, which is nothing but some more than Hermetic text. This is just an updated version of this. This is one of the last ones to come out. Come out, I think it came out, um, I think it came out in 99. So this is one of the last ones that came out of the Hermetica. There's a new Hermetica that came out in 99. Also, a uh, 98, also Late, late 98, 99, it's called another book called Hermetica. And there's also another book called Hermetica by Copenhagen, which is a real scholarly breakdown of these earlier scriptures by Walter Scott, Copenhagen's book, Hermetica. So there's three Hermeticas out, and The Way of Hermes, which is one of the last ones to come out on this particular stuff, put out by Inner Tradition, uh, Inner Tradition which is an esoteric book company. Um, um, um. Now, the this priesthood that stretches back to Atlantis apparently was schooled in the ancient art of alchemy. The ancient art of alchemy. They had, and the ancient art of alchemy is not only the study of the universe, the stones in the universe, the stones on the earth, the atoms in the universe, the breakdown of the universe, every single element that goes in the making of the physical and the spiritual. The physical and the spiritual. The ancient art of alchemy deals with that. It is the highest form of education or the highest form of science. It's the highest science ever known to man. The ancient art of alchemy. It is also the study of melanin. And melanin is the God substance that oozes through the veins and it is the biological makeup of the most ancient people on earth, the God race, the sage race, called the African race. If you want to call it a race. The ancient schools of Atlantis are Kemet. Take your pick. The ancient schools of Atlantis and Kemet. You had priesthoods. These particular priesthoods at this particular time taught the ancient word and the ancient science of alchemy. They also taught the most advanced form of gene splicing. We're talking about people so advanced until in uh, uh, Sir Lawrence Gardner's video he talks about, which is from this ancient dragon society they got over in Europe in England. And they talk about, uh, in Scotland, wherever, they talk about how when the Egyptian, when, when the uh, when the Europeans went up into Kemet's, first Napoleon and then after that a whole host of crackers, 
um, a whole host of crackers went up in the Kemet. The British got there and they found in the Great Pyramids this white substance. And whatever this substance was, if they put this powder on this book, this book, book would float. If they put this powder on this glass, this glass would float. If they put this powder under this house, this house would float. They put it under your automobile, the old automobile would float. This suggests a science of even the building of the pyramids. Because even Sir, uh, because even Ali Van Sertima told me back in 1989 that he even heard read about how the Egyptians could throw some stuff on the ground and the ground would turn slick as ice and they could slide things. Well, we're talking about the ancient art of alchemy. So they had the science on whether they could move tons, these objects, with this particular power. This particular power. In Lewis Spence's book, Occult Sciences of, of, of Atlantis, if you get your hands on that, which is one always out of print, Occult Sciences of Atlantis by Lewis uh, Spence's book talked about how they could make this black powder outside of the body. They could literally make this melanin outside of the doggone body. There was advanced alchemists of the royal art. They found out how they could, they could make this particular science. Now, this particular uh, substance. Now, the British came in to, 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 to Kemet. They took this white powder and put it on a ship and set sail with this powder, a whole ship full of this powder, to set sail to go back to England with it. The fools didn't tie it down, and by the time they got back to England, the entire ship of this white powder, which if you put it on this glass, it would float, blew away, except a saucer full that they still got in the British Museum and some cult societies, uh, cult societies. So, they had the ancient art of alchemy, even down to the ancient art of gene splicing, which the white boy has mastered at least since 1945, which we know of as cloning. Which we know of as cloning. Now, apparently in these particular schools, after hundreds of years or thousands of years of teaching people to master the body, master gene splicing, Master Alchemy, they had a renegade group of students who broke away from the main priesthood. And these particular students who broke away from the main priesthood traveled up into Europe and with the ancient art of gene splicing set up laboratories in Europe, apparently in the caves. They set up these particular laboratories with gene splicing and they used several animal DNA along with human DNA. Animal DNA along with human DNA and they spliced together a hybrid species. A hybrid species, a form of a counterfeit spirit which has a mock nuclei and one ring of consciousness which is a mock, it is a hybrid species. They use different aspects of animal DNA, ape DNA, pig DNA, cat, rat, dog, whatever, and human DNA. And the end result was that the first level of that particular one was a very advanced level, it was a Sasquatch. I know this shit sounds funny. <laughs> you know, a Bigfoot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It sounds funny, but truth is stranger than fiction. 
which was a Sasquatch type of ape type figure that was very advanced because it had the first level, the first levels of the human human DNA in it, which means that it had a, a higher intelligence. And from that, they grafted down several species down to what you get is the dog on European, which was like a dumber form of a species, which later on the intellect had to evolve. It's, it's in the movie Multiplicity. Remember they were cloning? Yeah, in the movie they was cloning down and he, he cloned two of them and he cloned that third one and he was dumb as shit. <laughs> you remember that? That's what we're talking about here. So they grafted down to that last and final product Although it was hairy, it wasn't as hairy as the Sasquatch. So they had several beings and stuff like that. That's the reason why this particular Sasquatch thing um, can stay out of sight. What little races of that that is remaining and stuff, they got stories on this particular stuff. That ain't nothing but a, a, a relative of the dog on European. Now, in 1999, coming from Penguin Books, why is it that they would publish, republish some H.P. Lovecraft works, which is t published by tons of doggone authors, t t tons of publishing houses, but in this particular one, Penguin Books out of, Atlanta, uh, out, of out of England, in 19, excuse me, 99, they would republish something, they would put a footnote in the back, the facts concerning the late Arthur Jenman and his family, which is supposed to be a fictional character, but this is interesting because we know that H.P. Lovecraft was a form of all types of occult scientists. And H.P. Lovecraft was a so-called fictional writer that wrote all this stuff on the, the Cthulhu mythos and these ancient race of beings and stuff, which their chief avatar or their chief person that, 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 that is over these ancient race of beings is a black man by the name of Miriam Hotel. The H.B. Lovecraft says this in this particular thing. Resounding opening utterance is one of the most celebrated passages of H.B. Lovecraft fiction that contains a curious phase of science. Perhaps to be the ultimate um, exterminator of our human species and uh, if, if separate species we be. Now, the last clause is critical. This generalized statement concerning the possibility of human beings may not be entirely human. It is not logically deductible from a single case of miscegenation. What H.P. Lovecraft appears to be suggesting is that the inhabitants of a primal African city of white apes are not only the missing link between a uh, uh, missing link between apes and human, but the ultimate source of the white civilization. The entire white race derived from a primal race in Africa, a race which had corrupted itself by intermingling with apes. This is the only expl explanation of the narrator's opening statement which says, if we knew who we were, as Sir Arthur Jenman did, i.e., we would commit suicide. We may not have white ape in our immediate ancestry, but we are all products of, a, of an ultimate miscegenation. And this is coming from the 1999 footnotes in the back of the Cthulhu Mythos book called Cthulhu, a penguin publication out of London, England. Now why would they put this back here and all? Now first of all, what's the name takes this statement and writes the movie and writes the novel Congo? What's the boy's name? Um, they wrote the movie um, Congo. He also wrote um, Jurassic Park and all those movies. Um, um, he wrote Congo, Jurassic Park, uh, um, Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton writes Congo because he's getting this particular stuff from H.P. Lovecraft. But on the other hand, to clear this up, they didn't intermingle with a race of apes. This is a fictional piece, or this is a, a somebody trying to trying to sum up something that's greater. In so many words, if you put this on a high scientific thing, they grafted ape DNA with all other kind of ape uh, uh, DNA. So the white boy is right when he when um, 
They say that they come from apes. And this whole um, origin of species of natural selection based on your boy Charles Darwin. Now we know that Charles Darwin in in academia now in 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 in, in, in all Western education now you, you gotta you can't cross you gotta stay on both sides if you're gonna be legitimate. Based on their legitimacy, on the, what they say. They they set the guidelines for what they want in their universities. And they're saying based on their scholarship, Western scholarship, you either got to believe in the, the evolution theory of Charles Darwin that we all came from apes, or you got to believe in the creation theory of the Bible and most Western religions. You see what I'm saying? And never the two shall merge themselves together. Number one, because they're trying to hide the origin of this whole ape thing. They'll, they'll put it behind that and stuff. Because the simple fact, they want everybody to believe we came from one single source. The apes. And so therefore, and other than to say we came from the ancient black man. This is the key on this doggone Charles Darwin thing. Which was a part of, which was a part of secret societies. Which was a part of a, a, of a secret society that came up with this foolishness and stuff. It was a consortium of the secret societies just that Charles Darwin is the author of the book. You see what I'm saying? That what's the natural selection or whatever the name of the book is and all. So he gets credited for this particular Darwin theory, but it's the secret society's plan to somehow cover up the fact that the black man at that time was the ancient origin of everything. Now this stuff, the Darwin stuff comes out around the same time that the white man in England was interested in the origin of the races and pulled that old fake ass shit called the Pilt Pilt Down Man. Where they went and got some cup of bones and put them all together and buried them and came and found them and said that the origin of the man was in England. And the shit stood for years until somebody came and found out the shit was a fake. They, the Pilt Down Man came on the heels of them finding some bones in South Africa. They later on found the Lucy bones in East Africa, but they found some bones in South Africa that was very old. So this whole thing that is going down with Charles Darwin and all of this stuff is going on at the same time where they're trying to either authenticate the oldest man being in England, which is some old fossil hybrid species or some old ape species, or the oldest, or they, they, they saying that man came from ape. So some people say, well, Bobby, they got these hominid species. They have all these species of these different apes and stuff. Archaeology, archaeology proves it. Yes, it proves it. It proves that there was different species of ape. But it don't prove that our black ass came from it. You see what I'm saying? See the mind here that thing is? Yes, we have different species of ape. Just like we got a damn saber-toothed tiger based on a modern tiger. We got different species of birds. But it don't prove that man came from the different species of ape. They can't bit more prove that this shit evolved into the black man. Now who am I going to go by? Am I going to go by a bunch of crackers that's talking about a bunch of different species of apes? Which we have an origin. Yeah, we will give them. The white man does have an origin from an uh, ultimate miscegenation coming from apes. But we don't. Now who am I going to believe? I'm going to believe the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Africans, the, all the ancient society that say that we came down by way of a transference from another dimension, if you want to call it, another vibratory rate, if you want to call it, and if you want to get plain with this thing, we came from heaven. We came from the star Sirius, as the Dogon say and the Egyptians say. Whatever you want to call it and stuff, how is it that all of our ancient people, the most advanced people on the earth, never suggested we come from apes? But I'm not going to believe Charles Darwin, a white man. But I'm not going to believe what the Egyptians say. I'm not going to believe what none of our ancient black people say. We don't have an African on the planet. We don't have no ancient people on the planet. We don't even have the Greeks. 
We don't even have the so-called Sumerians, if you want to believe there is a Sumerian. You don't have the Babylonians. We don't have the Persians. We don't have none of the so-called other made-up ancient races and stuff. But we don't have the most advanced people that know some stuff. We don't have nothing on the temple walls of, uh, uh, of Kemet. We don't have nothing on the temple walls of Seti-1 saying, but just the white man was created. But on the temple walls of Seti-1, and these are the most advanced priests, they say that we came from the eye of Ra. Uh, we came from the eye of Newt. We came from the eye of Newt. We came from the eye of Noon. We came from the eye of the primordial waters of the primordial origin. This is the basis of all mythology. We don't have no mythology on the planet so just we come from apes. And yet we, we, we will take that shit with Charles Darwin because the white man sets the standard. So who am I going to believe? I'm going to believe the Egyptians that we are all not saying the most advanced white man can't build a damn pyramid now. He can't build an ancient Egyptian temple. Simple stuff. But yet I'm going to believe him about some eight things. But we know that this is to cover up the origin of the black man being the oldest in the world. And we still go by this foolishness to this day. Because if you can take the, if you can put us all as coming out of one species, you can doggone justify this crap of being here. He takes this timeline and he pushes it up to about 6,000 years. That means in actuality that is a time that we can trace his history. So if you say that Earth is only 6,000 years, so you damn sure can say that the white man been here all this time. And that's why Adam and Eve gets painted, painted white. As well as everything we see in creation is painted white. This is mind control. Do you think that our people um, have a problem with dominant and recessive genes? Understanding that concept? Yeah, we have a problem with everything. <laughs> you know, this is why if there ever was a, even if we talk about the good old Christians, they talk about there gonna come a time when things get so bad that God gotta damn intervene. Well, if there ever was a case for that, it would be a case for black people. Black people are not really a good analytical people to really analyze jack shit anymore. We're not a good people, and I'm not talking about us as the origin of the, 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 the prototype of mankind. I'm talking about this straight up Negroes. We're not a good people to analyze anything. Um, what one out of ten got good common sense. And I ain't talking about no damn, this ain't got nothing to do with no education. We are literally subjects of the United States government and we just basically cows grazing in the field. So if there's anybody who ain't going to analyze nothing and is going to realize anything about the recessive or anything like that, we have been reduced down to a people that just ain't going to doggone look into things outside of what this damn slave master tells us is legitimate. You see what I'm saying? That's just the that's just the problem we have. We'll get into that particular psychological aspect and all, but then again, there's so much stuff on it. The key going back is um another aspect is now you got a new school of scholars that try to put forth that the black man came from the ape. This is the black man, the black scholar now. Taking Darwin's theory and trying to make this shit reality with the Egyptians and all that shit, and yet they don't see no kind of shit to say this. Now, this is the key. The white man will even allow you to say that the black man was 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 white was white was was, was original, and he can even say that um, that he'll allow you to say that climate adaptability made the white man as long as you agree that everybody came from a fucking ape. You see what I'm saying? I don't see no damn apes just fucking around talking lately. I mean, hell, if, it, if, it, if, it, if, if they, if you got some damn apes that stood up and started talking, seemed to me that that process could repeat itself after a couple of million years. And I don't see no damn ape talking. You understand what I'm saying? I don't see no damn ape talking. One of the mysteries here is this. If we agree based on the Egyptian science or the Kamite or the Kemetic science or any ancient black science to say that we were advanced beings and we have evidence that we're advanced beings because we got what is called knowledge. It didn't evolve. It was always here. 
So how is it you got advanced beings and going by the premise that most of these black scholars are saying that the white that, that they, there was a group of Africans that got caught in the ice or the ice age. If we go going by that premise there's a group of Africans that got trapped in the ice age and somehow mutated. Seem to me if you're an advanced being because they were saying that they, 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 they made the premise that these were some type of um, dumb, hominid, ape-like people that got caught in the ice age. They was black. They were apes, but they was black. <laughs> they were some kind of black ape. <laughs> you see, now they done got a motherfucker. They was ape, but they was black. Or they was black, but they were some stupid type motherfuckers, like a black caveman. No kind of shit. But there were some old dumbass people that got caught in the ice age and over a couple of thousand years, a couple of hundred years, they mutated into white people. Now, if we take the premise of the Egyptians, we was always advanced people. How can an advanced motherfucker get caught in any damn thing? You, it starts snowing outside. You don't want to take your ass on the inside. Here's an advanced people, all of a sudden, they can't take their ass back to Africa. You know, they're advanced. Gods, more advanced. They can build a damn pyramid, but they can't get the fuck out the snow. You know, take your ass back to Africa, a, warm, a, a climate to a warmer climate, a migrate to a, a warmer climate. So they get stuck in the damn ice and turn white. They can build a damn pyramid, but they can't goddamn build a good snow sled. And I'm supposed to be buying this dumb shit. You see what I'm saying? Sounds like a conspiracy to me. So if these people were advanced, they either know when some weather ain't right. You know what I'm saying? It don't take an idiot here. We got, we, we the dumbest we ever been, but we know to get out of some fucking cold ass weather. But all of a damn sudden, these people get trapped under some ice or so shit and turn into white people. You know, you know what I'm saying? A nigga can't stand a cold room to this day. How the fuck he gonna stand some goddamn ice? Anyway, going on. Going on with this thing. They were advanced beings, and then the other thing is, is they trapped in ice. Well, the Eskimos live in ice, and they lie than a damn blue black man. And I ain't seen them turn and turn, uh, come down with some shit that look like fucking epi leprosy or uh, some type of um, uh, mad cow disease that make a motherfucker turn white. And they live up in the snow too, and they lie than the damn Africans, and yet they ain't turned white yet. You understand what I'm saying? So. Going into this particular science, we have a gene splicing that comes out of uh, that comes out of some ancient scientists. Some say the Yaku, whatever it is, it was a Yaku. It was a it was a it was a renegade group that broke off from the priesthood. It was a younger group. Apparently, they knew how to uh, create a physical shell. They knew how to create a spirit. That's, that goes along with the cloning process. Because all this thing is, is modern. All this is, is an ancient form of cloning. That's it. White man clones like, been cloning since 1945. This is an ancient form of cloning. Um, that's all this is. Um, gene splicing. Growing something. Growing cells. But in this case, throwing a whole bunch of animals up in the, in the pot. And making what this, this monster you have. Monster man, Frankenstein. Um, they, so this renegade group breaks off and they do this particular stuff because we also have the text where they say that the Egyptians had our biggest problem. We created another uh, race of men or we created a, another man. And so they break off and they do this particular, uh, uh, this gene splicing and from that they even make various other forms of races. Mainly your Asian and different things like this. Um, and they make various other forms of, 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 of races. Now, um, by the time the Egyptians that have this particular secret, they spend a greater part of the dynastic period keeping these, this newfound hybrid race out and writing on them such as the text in the Egyptian literature, um, the Egyptian literature, that they talk about the Egyptians' idea of the barbarians. And the barbarians, they talk, well, this is coming from the, uh, 
the Chester Bailey Papyrus, the Chester Bailey Papyrus, which is another uh, Harad Papyrus of the British Museum, Chester Bailey Papyrus. Um, it talks about the Egyptian um, um, idea of the barbarians. They live in a miserable part of the world. Their water supply is wretched. It forces them to lead a nomadic existence. Although the ways of communication are poor because of the mountains and forests, hence they have a restless nature and always grumbling. That's what Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. And they cannot finally be defeated since the time be defeated since the time of Horus. Horus, however, because they are treacherous, they do not openly announce the day of battle. Like these, they shun, they shun a united army. The Egyptian Book of the Dreams is characteristic of the followers of Set. Now, in this time, Set Typhon at, at this particular time, uh, of the, when this particular document is, is, is written, is already reduced down to Satan. You understand the prototype of Satan. So, to, so the, the, the follow, so the, the, the followers, the Egyptian Book of Dreams, the, the, the characteristic followers of Set are Satan. It is not surely be chance by chance that we find the word Asiatics that were in this corrupt passage. They are not to be far supposed that according to the other Book of Dreams that the followers of Satan are set in this particular form are particular foreigners. Foreigners are Scythian people. Their sexual conduct to, to, is reprehensible. They are given to drink and they are quarrelsome and murderous. And they will indeed reach the West because they are in the West now, but will land in the neither world. And even, no, they will not indeed reach the West because the West is corresponding in Egyptian mythology as the end, the Osirian kingdom. But land in the neither world, which is this oblivion, you see, uh, 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 this, this oblivion um, that they're talking about. Um, even if a person becomes an official of the Pharaoh, they are also uh, said that the Egyptians were teased with they married outside of the whole comedic family and all. Also in the book, The Intellectual Adventures of Ancient Man by Henry Frankfurt, and um, Henry Frankfurt and John H. Wilson, um, they talk about above Kemet abnormal people. No, abnormal people and below Kemet normal people. So they talk about it in this particular book. They also talk about it in a, radic, in a book called Abduction Extraordinaire that they talk about this particular part where they say abnormal people above Kemet. And they were talking about this miserable Asiatic that they called them at that particular time, or this European, that they even suggested that what they, they even go in and talk about the mountains. They talk about the mountains, uh, uh, they talk about these mountains, or the Caucasus Mountains, and they said because of these mountains, the communication is poor, that lead them to, uh, they're always grumbling. They can't even speak. Count Barney talks about how the Egyptians taught them to speak. Well, in this passage, in the Egyptians talk about how they couldn't even speak. And the communication is poor because of the mountains and this harsh land that they come from. This is the Heretic Papyrus of the British Museum, Chester Bailey Papyrus of 1935 that, 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 they, that they got um, from ancient Kemet. Chester Bailey would be the person who bought the papyrus, and so therefore the papyrus is named after him also, too. Uh, uh, the Chester Bailey Papyrus. So, moving right along, um, moving right along, uh, this was the original clones. Um, they are also called counterfeit spirits. Now, apparently, the counterfeit spirits are separated from the true beings from a single essence. That single essence would be what we would call um, melanin. Or what we would also call soul. So there's a difference. Everything on the earth plane has a spirit. Uh, that the roaches have a spirit. Cats and hogs have a spirit. A spirit is what makes everything move around, along the earth plane. Not everything has a soul. Why? Because the soul it comes from the original origin before creation. The word soul means what? Sun. You study soul, you get the word solar. You get the word Saul, Solomon, Saul. 
Amen. Hidden son. Hidden God. The word soul means sun or star. That's what the soul is. It's a particle of light before creation. That which comes in after creation a creator on the earth plane cannot have, it is not it, it, it is not capable of having that that is created before the earth plane. Uh, before creation. So in this particular thing, it can have a spirit. Everything down here has a spirit. And an intelligence, basically. Because it just bars me going we'll go in that in a few minutes. But a soul is something different. There's the difference. But in this particular book, Hermetica, they say there are these people who are devoid of souls. In the Nag Hammadi, coming out of ancient Timber in 1945, they talk about these soulless ones who are called Hylix. And a Hylix, Hyle means physical earth. And these soulless people, although they might have a spirit, they are called Hylix. This is quintessential Camite or Egyptian thought. Now you got it in black and white. This is what the ancient priests knew. They're called highlights. There's a difference. So when they say, when you, when I cut you, know, I heard some of them say, when I cut you, you bleed. When you cut me, you bleed. You ever hear this shit? When I cut you, you will bleed. We all listen to the wind, the same goddamn it, a hog bleeds. You cut a hog, it bleeds. That don't mean nothing. <laughs> Hell, a damn fly bite your ass the right way, a mosquito, and I hit it on the shit. It might have just got the blood, but it sounds so bleeds. But a hog bleeds, a dog bleeds, a damn rat bleeds. That don't mean nothing. You see what I'm saying? That don't mean anything. Now, what this thing is is indicated in, uh, in the astral body by Lieutenant Colonel A.E. Powell's book. And Lieutenant Colonel A.E. Powell's book talks about it on page 169. But he also talks about the black magicians and its pupils. The class that corresponds to somewhat the that of an adept and his pupils, except the development has been for evil instead of good. The powers acquired being used for selfish and in, uh, uh, instead of altruistic purposes. Altruistic purposes, excuse me. Among its lower ranks, these are the practical rights of several. Medicine men in various tribes and higher uh, in higher intelligence, they are more than blameworthy of Tibetan black magicians. And so many words what he's talking about here, he's trying to indicate that there are groups of people that is renegade groups of people that literally, and, it's, and this is on page 168 of his particular book, he talks about voodoo schools, but he, he he's misguided because he didn't know anything. Because at that particular time, they was trying to uh, discredit uh, Voodoo. But in this particular book here, he goes in and he talks about how these black magicians of Atlantis created um, and dabbled in several things outside of good purposes or whatever type thing. And basically, so many words, created what he calls an astral corpse known as a shade, which this thing is an entity which is not really, in, in a sense, an individual at all. Nevertheless, it bears its ex exact personal experience, it appearances, possesses his memory. So if it's not an individual, who is the individual? The individual uh, who, who is the human is, black, is the black man. It possesses his appearances, which is, 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 is arms, legs, arms, legs, and feet. And, and, and arms, legs, and uh, head, torso. So the appearance, is, it has the shape of a human body. It might not look the same because it, obviously it's white compared to black. But possesses uh, his, his appearances, possesses his memory, and all his little, little idiosyncrasies. So, going back, an astral shade is known, an astral corpse is known as an entity which is not an individual in a, in, and not in a, any sense a real individual at all. Nevertheless, it bears an exact personal appearances, possesses its memory, and all little idiosyncrasies. It may therefore very be readily be mistaken for him, as indeed frequently in seances. It is not conscious of its act of interpretation, for, 
for as far as its intellect goes, it must necessarily suppose itself to be an individual. It is, in a sense, really merely nothing but a soulless bundle of all the lowest qualities. The limp of its life of the shade varies according to the amount of lower mental matter that animates um, that animates it. Because so this matrix of this particular physical plane is the only reason why it's living. It's because we got this 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 mental or uh, this physical realm this physical realm that keeps this damn thing going, but it is only a physical entity. It has nothing to do with the original person that will go beyond this, but it is steadily fading out. Its intellect is diminishing quaintly, and it was until they found out about this melanin and this melatonin stuff that they dealt, that they went into World War II and all this type of stuff here, and as a result from Yale University, they came up they, 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 they found out about the missions of the black man in melanin later on isolating the gene in 1968 and from that they're using this ancient elixir of melanin to stay alive and to keep functioning on a certain level um, on, on a certain level its intellect is diminished diminishing quaintly though it may possess a great deal of a certain animal cunningness even quite towards the end of its career, it is still able to communicate by borrowing temporary intelligence from the medium, the original ones. From its very nature, it is exceedingly liable to be swayed by all kinds of evil influences. And it is being separated from the higher ego. It has nothing, it has nothing in its constitution capable of responding to the good ones or what they call the original ones, the black ones. It is therefore lends itself readily by several minor purposes of some base, uh, baser sort of black magicians. The mental matter possesses gradually disintegrates and returns from the general matter of its own plane. So in so many words, whoever these magicians was doing, they was trying to create a new race of people for whatever thing they wanted lordship over. And they ended up dying up and we get these damn fools running the damn earth now as an experiment gone bad. This is uh, the, the, the Astro Body of, of 169 of the Astro Body, Lieutenant Colonel A.E. Powell's book that I mentioned in my, my, my tape, Human Artificial. Moving right along. Moving, moving right along. In the particular Nag Hammond, in the book, The Apocryphon of John, they talk about the creation of these counterfeit spirits, which are uh, these particular counterfeit spirits. Now, unfortunately, when we read these texts, we come to find out that in actuality, before they created the white man, based on these particular texts, that they created a counterfeit spirit of a black man. Which in so many words, it also says, and in so many words, you got black people down here that don't even have souls. Based on um, the amount of people that you have now compared to the original people. You got millions of people. You didn't have original souls. It was transferred down here, original sons. Um, S-U-N. So they talk about that, but that's a whole other lecture. Um, but uh, nevertheless, this is what we're still talking about is these particular counterfeit spirits. In um in the in the uh in Blavatsky's book, they talk about a chapter called No Shadow, No God, because the shadow in Jungian psychology and the shadow is also this in um the shadow that is also in uh uh that they talk about um that she's talking about in Blavatsky's works is nothing but melanin. Melanin is the key component, which in actuality is a substance that is created by a soul. So the soul creates the melanin in its purest form. It's just like you have a light and you strike a match and the next thing you know if you put up against that white wall you'll see that soot. That soot is coming from that fire. Well that's what the melanin does. It creates, the, the soul creates a shadow. And this original soul which is the word Christ, Christos, crystallized uh, essence, it gives off a shadow, which is this particular carbon, six protons, six electrons, six neutron, neutron, which is the basis of carbon, which is the basis of melanin. So melanin is created by the soul. And the soul is a little subatomic particle 
down in the gastrointestinal tract, or what they call the root chakra. Root chakra. Now, because it was an animal man, you always get this, you get this particular picture, and every now and then you get this particular picture here of, uh, this is a picture coming from, I, like I said, I, I had a friend named Wesley X had a lot of real pictures coming from Paris, France, where they had a lot of Europeans, they have a lot of pictures over in Europe of babies or children born with tails. This is one that I was able to get on the European born with a tail. Um, born with a tail, but um, it's um, uh, I got a better I got a better picture somewhere at the house and all. But this is the one I reproduced in the in the particular book, Human Artificials. Um, but uh, but in so many words and all, there's several ones, and they got several pictures over in Europe where this is common. They just amputate these things now at birth and all like that. They just amputate these things at birth at, at birth also now. Um, now moving right along. Uh, in so many words, because this particular entity comes in at a time and not at the time before creation or during creation, when it's transferred down here, this particular entity that we call um, does not have the full function of the pineal gland, which produces the melanin or synthesizes the actual melanin. It doesn't have the full function of that particular pineal gland. Um, as well as we know now in the whole mysteries of melanin, um, even to the point where as it's inferior sexually, and now the new thing with Viagra is Viagra is made of melanin, which is proved, I even, we even have the brochures that we get ready to have this Hemet Summit down here, where they literally uh, show the white boys taking doses of melatonin, and, um, um, uh, melatonin, and as a result of taking the doses of the melatonin, they had advanced heightened sexual activity, arousal. So the Viagra and several things right now is made of the actual melanin, made of the actual melanin. One of the keys here on why this particular thing functions and literally took over the planet Earth and literally killed off tons of the indigenous people around the earth, millions and millions of indigenous people around the earth, and made us small, as the Book of Enoch said. We even became food for them. As the Book of Enoch suggests, R.H. Charles' Book of Enoch, the Ethiopian Book of Enoch, was not added into the Old Testament because, number one, it's way older. We have become food for them. Um, now they're taking the melatonin pills so they can do this stuff in style. But the reason why they are this way at all because of the simple fact that they have a closed down heart chakra. Now based on the e Egyptian, the heart is the gateway for the outer universe. It is the gateway that suggests also something of a primordial nature because they didn't come from a primordial nature. Their heart chakra is closed down. That means that they don't have the type of feeling we have. They have a guilt sufficiency, deficiency, excuse me, a guilt deficiency. And that guilt deficiency and all their sociopaths by nature, which means they can justify it. They can live by it. We're talking about a psychopath, a sociopath. We're talking about a sick individual which now has the entire world sick. Because he's only operating off of what he said, a third of his particular brain. Whereas we, the other, that's right, because the other part of the brain is being... It, it can be can be accessed by the pineal gland, and since now we only since now we live in a society where it is set up to even access only a third of the brain. We're not even trained into accessing the greater part of the brain, but we used to do it all the time. It was called talent. It was called genius. And they have cut off from accessing that third part of the brain. That, that, that the other regions of the brain, excuse me, because they don't have the pineal action or the pineal ability. So when you hear about no one will enter into, in, into the kingdom unless they're circumcised, they're not talking about circumcision of the penis. Because what about a woman? They're talking about circumcised because uh, uh, the because also the pineal gland is also called the penis of God. 
And the uncircum and, and the pineal gland that they're talking about is not necessarily talking. It's not necessarily talking about the penis down here. It's talking the, 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 the uncircumcised penis is talking about a calcified pineal gland, which broken down. That's uncircumcised, which means it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And all of the above, they can't see, they can't hear. Um, the DNA. If it's a mock nuclei with one ring of consciousness, even the DNA is only two strands. But they are even saying now that even in genetics, even as far as um, whatever the deal is based on this, um, they're pretty much up shit creek. Um, up shit creek. Uh, Gerald Mass's book, Gerald Mass's lecture talks about the Egyptians saying these are people of nothing. They are a nothing people with pig snouts and little tails. This is what the Egyptians, the Camites, say. They are like unto spittle. In Deuteronomy, they say a people that's not even a people. It's Deuteronomy, they say a people that's not even a people. Now, um, what is this thing? Originally, there was two types of people on earth. There are completely different types of consciousness inhabiting similar physical bodies. So, there's only two types of people. The original offspring of the black race and then this hybrid race. 70% of our bodies have a, a, a demonic counterfeit consciousness which has been created by an evil demiurge or the express purpose of, 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 uh, of surviving evil. They... They do this by attacking the remaining population the, in energy terms in order to exploit them and steal their energy from them. They are, uh, they are rebellious, belligerent, and destructive and evil. Their attacks are not merely physical, but, but more in a subtle level, translated into the multitude of ways of draining energy from the beings of light. Less than 30% of the bodies have a divine consciousness within. There are divine nature and in, and, and in the nature is not one of, of is not one of uh, what's this word? Warmongering, excuse me. I have to slow down. Warmongering. So they're saying that the the, uh, the nature of the divine beings are not one of warmongering. In fact, these are generally uh, disintegrated by the struggle and have, uh, have proved to be easy prey. So they have been uh, uh, disintegrated by the struggle. And they are attacked and lose energy to the evil essence and they undergo a disastrous conscious equivalent to slow spiritual death. So they're saying it in so many words that these counterfeit beings um, drain energy from the original from the original beings. They drain energy from the, origi the original beings. And basically that's what the A.E. Power book say that it possesses the memory and basically the drains energy from the original beings and that's what these particular counterfeit spirit does. What, what books are you reading from? This is coming this is coming from uh Joseph Cipollone's stuff. Making sense of the madness, what's going on. He has several books out. Joseph Cipollone out of Australia, if you can still get a hold of these particular books. Um and he talks about the two beings in society. One is a counterfeit spirit but also, uh, uh, counter, and he's also what he's doing is he's, he's basically breaking down the Nag Hammadi Library of the Gnostic scriptures dug up in 1945. He's putting it in his synopsis, but it's all coming out of chapters in here called the Apocryphon of John, and a book and a chapter in here called the Tripartite Tractate. The Nag Hammadi Library translated well. Uh, uh, um, the definitive new translation of the Gnostic scriptures is complete in one volume, which it took them damn near 40 years or, or whatever, 40-something uh, years or maybe 30-something years to translate into English, edited by James Robinson. So he's taking this, the actual scriptures and breaking it down, and his terminology is based on these counterfeit beings. Joseph Cipollone, in his books, Making Sense of the Madness and what, What's Going On, also. 
uh, 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 breaking that particular science down. Um, breaking that particular science down. So, um, in so many words, what you have, what you have is so much evidence on this particular person being a created being or a hybrid made being until we could go on for a whole year trying to explain this stuff. It is just that vast on this particular immigrant human, as they call it, or what they call the intruder. The, 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 the intruder. Several texts, like your hermetic texts, talk about this animal man. Talks about this particular animal man. Um, if you read the true mythology, it is, it is clear. It is clear of what this stuff is actually talking about. You got any questions? Yeah, we um, we got change tape. Then we come back with some questions. Okay. How many hours is that? So summing this thing up and all, this is a, a, a this is an update on a, on on a, something I did seven years ago called the Human Artificial and actually wrote a pamphlet on it. Um, I put together, comprised a pamphlet on this thing. This is just other information re-entry into this where we give new scholarship, especially a lot of stuff coming from the Nag Hammadi Library, Nag Hammadi Library, and the whole Hermetic, the Hermetica series that we didn't have at that particular time. Um, at that particular time, uh, we had Thrice Great Hermes, but we didn't have Walter Scott's book. We had um, G. R. S. Mead's book, and some new stuff that's coming from Australia. What's going on by Joseph Cipollone? as well as Making Sense of the Madness, uh, Making Sense of the Madness uh, uh, by Joseph Cipollone. Um, the book The Gnostics by Tobias Curtin that, 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 that also mentions Mary Shelley Frankenstein in that. Um, later on, like I said, the book uh, Rudolf Steiner's book, uh, Atlantis and Lemuria, as well as uh, H.G. Wells' uh, movie, or uh, his particular novel, put in a movie in 1996, played by the top actor in the white race, Marla Brando. Marla Brando, uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau. In so many words, to sum up, when it comes to people that's dealing with the theory of this particular thing, they have nothing. The only stuff that we do have is these particular texts that I have given seven years ago and given now, which is this particular stuff in mythology and by the Egyptians and the ancient, and they say, the ancients say that this is a hybrid made species created by an ancient priesthood, also documented in Lieutenant Colonel A.E. Powell's book, Astro Body. Uh, 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 Astro Body. Um, so, in so many words, this is an update into this particular information, into this particular information with new light and new works by the Nag Hammadi Library and the Gnostic side of things, as well as a couple of other things too. And so um, this is where we end with this stuff, um, giving more information into this particular research. And there's tons of this particular research, and so we even challenge you to even go in and even find more and more to this particular sign. But nevertheless, it is Making the Amr Elias Muhammad's work legitimate that we used to laugh at, we find more in the ancient archaeological and anthropological evidence to suggest that than we do in this theory stuff coming out of regular academia. Check. Did we get it?